Welcome, my friends, to episode 34 of Jock Talk. Hope you guys are having a great day and that you are prepared to be entertained and dazzled for the next hour or so as me and Big Joe and the Big Rig get you ready for the Cowboys game and the holiday season. Um, don't forget, this is the holiday season. I just mailed off four copies of my book, uh, Coach Prime, Deion Sanders and the Making of Men. Uh, I spent the 2022 season in Jackson uh, studying him and what makes him work, had full access to the program, and you can find that book wherever you buy books, Amazon, barnesandnoble.com, walmart.com, Target, wherever you get them, you can find it. And, uh, yeah, we're still holding strong on the new release uh, top ten uh, at Amazon. Also want to tell you, I know y'all heard some of that long story. My Twitter got deleted, but I'm back. Hard to keep a good man down. You can follow me on Twitter at JJT Journalist. I am Jean-Jacques Taylor. It ain't hard to find, baby. Uh, and then, you know, I was looking at something today, and it said it was, uh, matter of fact, I took a picture because I wanted to tell y'all, I don't be making this stuff up. It was, it was, I found this on Twitter, and it's a settlement alert from Greening Law, and it was a happy client. Outstanding law firm just helped me with my auto accident case. My car was totaled by an uninsured driver, plus I had injuries. Greening Law took care of everything with my insurance, doctors, et cetera. Highly recommended. And I tell y'all this. Number one, punch the phone. Punch the number in your phone, 972-934-8900. That way, when disaster happens, you ain't got to go looking for it. Point number two, if you're ever involved in an accident and it's not your fault, most of the time we think about car accidents and stuff like that, but it could happen at a business. It could be something related to a doctor. If there's some negligence involved and you've been injured and it's not your fault, pick up the phone and call my friends at Greening Law, 972 972- 934-8900 and simply tell them your situation. They'll ask you a few questions and I'm telling you, if they add you as a client, it's been a great day for you. Real, real talk. It's been a great day for you because they will walk you through the process. You need a doctor's appointment, they can set those up. You need a uh, specialist, they can set that up too. They tell you everything to do during the process so that you can work on health and renewal and getting your body back right. Because that's what's most important, getting your body back in shape so that you can remember what it's like to feel normal again. And that's what they want you focused on, getting your body right, health and renewal, and getting right. And so if you're involved in an accident, it's not your fault, give Greening Law a call. Now check this out. They don't get paid unless you get paid. Simple as that. They don't collect the nickel, a dime, a quarter, as I like to say, unless you get paid. So you don't have to worry about how hard they're working for you, whether they're grinding for you, whether they're up late, up late night burning the midnight oil. They're doing whatever it takes to help you in your situation. Uh, so 972-934-8900, that's the number. Give them a call and let them help you, all right? Do that for me. Put that number in your phone right now. I know you ain't do it the first time. Do it now. Um, let's, uh, this is a weird week because it's Thanksgiving week. It's a stretch where the Cowboys play 12, three games in 12 days. It's, uh, it's, always, uh, it's always hard, and, uh, and it puts the media and everybody else on a different schedule. So I was telling my, uh, my content guy that uh, today is Tuesday, but it's like a Wednesday in Cowboys world. And while tomorrow is Wednesday, it's really like a Saturday in Cowboys world. So everybody's schedule is messed up and mixed up. So that being said, we're going to start this show with my boy Todd Archer, ESPN Insider, brought to you each and every Wednesday by uh, my friends over there at Smokey John's Barbecue. Hello. What up, bro? What's going on? Oh, not much. Did I interrupt dinner? Uh, nope, not yet. <laughs> cool. <laughs> hey, I was uh, actually I was just explaining to everybody that uh, uh, the schedule's all mixed up when we deal with Thanksgiving week. And uh, but anyway, uh, as as we look at the Cowboys and we look at the Commanders, I'm already on record as saying, and I don't think I'm breaking any news here, they can't win if the Cowboys don't help them. You agree with that assessment? Yeah, I mean, look, I, I'm not going to act like like I watched any of Washington's game last week against the Giants. I just know how bad the Giants were the previous week, right. and it stunned me that Washington lost at home. To the Giants, like, 
So, yeah, the Cowboys have to help them. Like, and look, there's some – Sam Howell's got some good numbers, and, you know, and Terry McLaurin's probably your favorite Ohio State receiver of all time. Um, you know, they, they, Logan Thomas has done a decent job. The Cowboys run defense has – I mean, there's always ways to win these games for, for teams, but, yeah, the Cowboys either have to play their worst game on defense or – and maybe and, not even or – and turn the ball over a ton. So, yeah, when we were uh, kicking the game around earlier today, I was like, you know, probably uh, the Sam Howell's got some nice numbers and some numbers you could be like, oh, that could pose a problem. And my only issue with it really was that what they do best is what the Cowboys do best, and they don't do it, you know, great. They just that's just what they do best. But the Cowboys' pass rush has been uh, one of the best in the league all year. Uh, they managed to get a, get to uh, Bryce Young, who's pretty mobile, quite a bit. And they got a secondary that'll take the ball from you if you put it in harm's way. So it seems to me like their strength kind of matches up with the Cowboys' strength, offense to defense, and that poses another problem for them. Right, and and I was talking to someone in Washington today. They they don't run the ball. Not that they can't run the ball, but it seems like they don't run the ball. And how many times have we said that around here? You know, uh, over the years, although maybe not with with Zeke was at his prime. Um, so you know, maybe that's not even an issue for, for for the Cowboys this week. Even though Brian Robinson ha- has talent and ability, it's that offensive line that seems to be a- an issue for Washington. Um, you know, and it has been an issue. Uh, you know, for how many years? So like, you go back to Joe Gibbs. Uh, not even the second time of Joe Gibbs. Maybe not 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 right, the first right. time. He's go that back far back, but. Um, but yeah, like you know, there's no Chase Young. They get rid of Montez Sweat as well. But for some reason, and maybe it's those two get part of those two guys. Although Young didn't play very many games against the Cowboys because he was hurt. Right. This is a difficult matchup for the Cowboys. They might win more than they lose against this team, but it always seems to be harder than it should be. And that's maybe just the product of it being a division game, right? Yeah, yeah, I think so. And you know. I, you know, it's, it's always hard to know exactly what players think, but I do know for a fact that the city of Washington, or, you know, as much as we can call Washington, D.C. a city, fans of Washington fans take this as, they still think it's the 70s when it comes to the rivalry. They still, you know, get mad, you know, give the bust the finger and all that stuff. Uh, I've got cousins who live up there who are like, yeah, F the Cowboys. Uh, and I'm like, duh, Dallas fans ain't thinking about y'all. About well, that, that's the funny thing. Yeah, like in Washington, it's Dallas week. It's Dallas week. Has anybody <laughs> once said this week it's Washington week? Like, no. no. And, and I, I always think, like, since I've been covering these guys, right, I, I, I think the who the rival is is kind of ebbed and flowed. Like, let's say in the height of the Romo era, it was more the Giants, in, in my mind, because – they won the Super Bowls, and that was a team that knocked them out in 07. Maybe early on in Marcel's early tenure, it was Philadelphia because Andy Reid was running the division and really running it up against the Cowboys and it, but before Bill got here. Um, I don't know when the Washington, you know, the RG3 era might have been it, but it lasted so, it was so short that <laughs> it was right. really the RG3 game on Thanksgiving. I've never seen Jerry more mortified after a game than that RG3 game when he Dude. lit him up with then you know four touchdown passes maybe and he's yeah. like oh my gosh I got to deal with this for the next decade it turned out he didn't so I, I don't know when Washington was from a Cowboys perspective was at the top of the list uh, uh, for, for Cowboys fans as their rival I think Certainly you're right I think, you, I think you're right I think it was just that little bitty two or three year stretch because I remember us talking about that after the game and I remember you telling me that that Jerry was saying that and I was just like dude he's not wrong like yeah. <laughs> like RG3 <laughs> looks like the truth yeah, I remember when they beat him in that last game of the season I guess to knock him out of the playoffs and uh, RG3 was like it's okay Tony you'll you'll be back or something some little You're still condescending. A good quarterback yeah, yeah all that stuff, I was gonna yeah. say some little condescending remark that he made uh, before we go deeper on on Washington, because I mean, after all, it's the commander. We really have to go that deep. <laughs> that, that's what I'm saying. Uh, we were kicking this around earlier, and I'm interested to know what your opinion is. There's been a lot of weird finishes, plays, instances with this Washington team. What I've is got. Were you going to Santana Moss me? Well, that's that's in the conversation. But which one? Okay. 
Which one stands out to you as like, I just can't believe that poop? Well, all right, I'm going to go end of the half in 2000, whatever, where instead of running the ball or taking a knee, Garrett calls a swing pass to Deshard Choice and he fumbles, and I think they return it for a touchdown, right? This uh, is true. This is true. It, that was – Wade was the coach, so that was – Sometime in 2000. Was it 07, 08, 09, something yeah. like that? One of those years. Um, I would put – yeah, that one probably has to be the most – what the hell was that? Because it just made no sense. But you're in, And another one that's running in my head was – I think Witten had like a 60-something yard touchdown catch against him, and he right. ran away from D'Angelo Hall. <laughs> like, literally ran away from D'Angelo Hall. Like, I, I remember like, whoo, man. That must have been like, young Witten. Uh, I think it was right around that same time. So, yeah, I mean, <laughs> the guy played 18 years. So, yeah, I guess it was young Witten if you're, if you're going to break it up that way. Right, oh, man, right. he got me thinking. There was the four, Romo comeback game before when he blew his back out. Uh, you know, and, and still played. He threw the fourth down touchdown pass yeah, to, right, right, to DeMarco right. Murray. And I think, Dude, yeah. now I think that was the Deshard choice game, the same one that ended when Tony threw a touchdown pass to Roy Williams that would again won the game, but Alex Barron had a holding penalty. Was that Dude, the same I, game? I can't even remember because you still haven't mentioned the one that I'll never forget, even though I can't remember uh, well, all wait the details from Are we, was I covering the team with you? Yeah, I'm pretty sure you were. Okay. I mean, I know you were at this well, game. Well, we went Santana Moss ago. at the end, Santana Moss game. Right, that's like two touchdowns in the last three minutes or something. Right, they where he just ran by. That was, that was the end of Roy Williams' career. That's when we were like, uh, oh, right wow. There. No, man, it's the um, game where the Cowboys, and I don't, I'm not oh, even sure nope, what I got it, I got it. No, 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 no <laughs> I got it. It was 2006, block field goal. Yes. Return, Sean Taylor, <laughs> face max, Kyle Kozar. <laughs> The, and the Washington kicks the field goal with no time on the Dude, clock. That was yes. Romo's first road loss. Is that How right? How weird was that one? Yeah. Okay, we got we to make sure y'all understand what we're saying because we're laughing because we both remembered it. No, Dallas is lining up for a game-winning field goal against Washington. I think Vanderjet was still the kicker. Yeah, I think so. They're lining up for the kick. There's a chance to win the game. Okay, great. The kick is blocked. Okay, that's terrible. But – uh, I think they were going to overtime if they don't make it. So, you know, we'll make the kick and win it, or we'll go to OT. The kick is blocked. Sean Taylor picks it up. He gets tackled somewhere around the 35 or 30, something like that. Or, no, he gets tackled around midfield. But there's yeah. a face mask on the play. Kyle Kozier, 15 yards. Game can't end. There's no time left. There's one play. Washington lines up and kicks the field goal to win it. And that, my friends, I'm pretty sure is the most bizarre ending of a Cowboys game ever. The only yeah. one that rivals it to me. And I remember, Arch, I know you were there. You had to help me with the details. It was sometime around the same era. Drew Bledsoe's at the end of the game. And, again, it's either overtime or something. Or, you know, win the game or go to overtime. And he throws a pick with, like, 10 seconds left on an out route. And they return it just long enough to, for Josh Brown to attempt like a 50-yard field goal as time expires up in Seattle. Yeah. And I remember that because we went to have dinner at Chamberlain's. We went to the Metropolitan Grill. And yes, Josh Metropolitan Grill. <laughs> yep. Yes. Yeah. So, uh, but, yeah, this is what happened when you play the commandos. You get goofy, goofy talk and rhetoric like this. And, uh, but it, it, it was fun. So those are some of the wildest uh, Washington finishes um, I remember. Now, back on the highway, since we took a very nice exit ramp, exit yeah. route there. Uh, I thought you asked a really interesting question today. Uh, back in the old days, it'd be a really good story that nobody else had, I think. But uh, in today's world, where everything has to be a group interview for the most part, uh, everybody else then chimed in on your story. But you were asking Dak, I think, uh, whether he, how he didn't let the noise affect him or how he didn't let criticism bother him. Uh, Why did you decide right. to come out with that this week? Well, what made you think about that type of story? Um, well, it's not for this week. Uh, oh. It's it's for it's so for later on. Yeah, we got a couple of th different things I'm working on for Seattle and Philadelphia. So it depends on what else I can get. The and probably because at some point 
Dak's going to have a okay to mediocre game right. and everybody's going to jump on him and he's just going to get ripped to shreds. Uh, and, and look, I, I'm not going to sit here and say like the media, like another one of the guys you have on your podcast will always say, uh, because we are, we are part of the media. So if you, I'm not going to be media ombudsman here, Excuse but me. shots fired. <laughs> I, I mentioned no names. I don't know what you're talking about. Although I'll get <laughs> Zach's favorite line is if you think I'm talking about you, I'm talking about you. Um, uh, from, from Dion. Um, but it's just the, the, the life that he has to live as the quarterback of the Cowboys is constantly, he's like one of the Walenda brothers, right? He's on this tightrope that the second that he makes a misstep, he just gets jumped on. And I, I just find it, hilarious that people think he's a not a good quarterback he's absolutely a good quarterback and he's been a good quarterback for a long time is he a quarterback he can win a super bowl with i don't know he's not done it yet so i think you can if you got a lot of if you have the right people uh players and coaches and scheme and defense and uh, around them yeah is he patrick mahomes no but that doesn't there's only how many of those guys are walking around so it just got me thinking about about that and what his reaction is. And I asked CD the same question of like, look, all of you guys are under scrutiny as Cowboys because of the star in the helmet. What you know? Would you ever want to trade spots with Dak? And and he, he said he was like, nope. <laughs> I don't. You know. So they, they even them his teammates know that what he deals with is on a different level than any of them. And I think Dak has always handled that so well that he just kind of wanted to get his take on it. No, well, he was pretty good about it. I mean, Dak is pretty good about about most things. Uh, and so I wasn't surprised, but... Um, and that was interesting. I thought when he was like, look, when he got drafted, what's the first thing? I don't know how people do this stuff, but they scrolled through his Twitter feed and they found a tweet of him trashing Romo. <laughs> and we talked about this a couple weeks ago, that the Dak... And Romo are now on like similar paths of of how they're viewed, maybe locally and nationally, and, and where they are in their careers. That they've always been good quarterbacks, but people just want to crush them for for whatever. Probably because they play for the Cowboys, obviously. But um, right. and you know, so Dak's like, look, I was one of these guys once. I had that tweet. You know, everybody saw it. No, he, matter of fact, that that may have been uh, real talk. That may have been the first question. I ever asked Dak, uh, you know, when he was uh, on, on, a, on his first availability. Um, so it's uh, it's funny how, it, how it's all turned over the uh, over the last few years uh, because he's definitely at the center of the storm now. And it doesn't matter whether the storm is good or the storm is bad. He's at the center of the storm now. And so, uh, you know, the best thing about him is and this is a good time to go down another rabbit hole. The best thing about him is he seems to me to handle it very well. And to me, again, it's just me, it's your boy, um, I think that's a key thing that you've got to be able to do if you're going to play quarterback in the National Football League because we know some guys don't handle it as well. Kyler Murray comes to mind. Mm -hmm. And to me it's also a topic, and I, I had a debate as much as a man can have with 30 followers these days since somehow my Twitter account got deleted. Uh, <laughs> I mean, it's true. Um, but I, I was half both things. You had bad honest. luck with your social media presence Dude. over the years. Yeah, I know, but, you know, I don't know, man. That's, Talk about that's rabbit a, holes. We, we can I was going to say, that's another exit ramp. Now, you know, we had a long wings conversation on uh, me and Matt did when I was doing my show at ESPN. Uh, but anyway, uh, that doesn't have anything to do with this. Uh, but uh, the topic came up because I was talking about Caleb Williams at USC and how he didn't want to talk to the media this week after they lost to UCLA. And you got your people saying, hey, he's just a 22-year-old kid. Leave him alone. He doesn't have to talk to the media. And I was like, you know, back in the day, I might have agreed with that. But when you put yourself – and I'm not mad at him at all because I'm all for the athlete. But when you put yourself in position, you say, hey, I want – you know, an endorsement deal with Wendy's and I want these national endorsement deals, then you're really no longer an amateur. You're a pro. And that's cool. I got no problem with that. 
you deserve the money, just like the coaches deserve the money. But when you're a pro, there's certain things required of being a pro, especially if you're going to be the face of the franchise or the face of the team. Um, you don't have any problem talking when you won the Heisman. So to me, you shouldn't. And you don't have any problem talking after you threw five touchdown passes. So you shouldn't have any problem talking after you lose to your, uh, you know, city rival in a game. And I mean, we're only talking five or six minutes, and questions ain't gonna be that hard. Uh, but to me, it's all about a maturity thing. And so as we talk about Dak handling criticism, trust me, dog. I, and this is just the way I feel. If you can't really handle it and deal with it. It affects your ability to be as productive as you can, especially at that position, right? Like that's the only position that, to me, right? That it really matters. It, it, and and I'm going to take Dak at his word that he doesn't see it, doesn't hear it. I, I'll take him at his word, but but I also say that like Dak doesn't let he doesn't if he does hear it and is aware of it, he doesn't let it sweat him he doesn't show it to us that it's affecting him right you know what i mean like so was it menon like never let him see a sweat that that i think it was menon back in the day right like that <laughs> that's that like he, he right? he's he's he never lets you see him sweat like it, it could and, and look he's human it should bother you know if he is aware of it 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 should bother him like that's fine like you know if it's if it if it if the criticism is fair, I think players are cool with it because they get it. If the criticism crosses the line and turns into personal attacks and things like that, then, then that's just ridiculous. And, and some of the stuff that's out that, that's said by people is professional wrestling. If we're being honest, like right. th- that, th- there, there's different levels of what media is these days, and the professional wrestling part of it is the loudest now. So that's what all these guys think. What we do is. Um, and you know, that, so that, that impacts some of the relation building that you can have as a media guy that that's changed over the years, but that's another rabbit hole we can avoid. But I think with Dak, like he's always got it. Like he's always understood. I'll, I'll go back to his rookie year and it's probably a little thing and you probably noticed it, but like when it was going good for him, he was the same guy. But when he, yep. when he, when it was bad for him. He was even more available to us. He was even, uh, he would sit in his locker room. We'd get him on a Wednesday. He would be there on Thursday. We'd BS with him. He'd be there on a Friday and we'd BS with him. Like he knew uh, maybe instinctively, or maybe it's just something that he, he was taught at Mississippi state or something, or someone fed him that information. I, I, I don't know, but he knew how to play the game and to, I don't even want to because that 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 sounds like well, it's something nothing. nefarious. No, but but he knew he knew he knew how to deal with things when it was going bad, to make sure he was staying on top of the me- he was he was controlling his own message. No, I think that's the best way. The thing that stands out to me, and I can't remember where he, I think he did it at the star. Um, and you probably remember this. Uh, it was probably that year he was playing poorly, so it was probably 2017. Uh, but he had done his, his interview, and then another session broke out near the uh, – just uh, over there by Zach Martin's locker. And he spent about another 15 to 20 minutes looking at somebody's phone, breaking down his interceptions. Like, well, here's yep. what I was looking at on this play, and here's what I did on that play, and I was thinking this and this and this and that and that and this. And what that does is – and I, I try to tell young players this. I uh, never really had to tell Dak this. But what that does is – it creates a relationship with the media where when you do have a bad game, they're much more likely to, to subconsciously cut you a break because you're a, air quote, good guy. Or yes. you're telling them and explaining to them, hey, here's my decision process. Like, I mean, you can dis- – I, I understand it's a pick, but here's the ten things that went into it of which you guys had maybe knew about one of them. Here's all the ten right. things that went into it. So now you can understand why I did that and, you know, why I said that was on me and not on the receiver. Or, right. you, know, you know, based on what I tell you, you can kind of figure out who it's on. Now, don't be quoting me on that, but that's for y'all to understand. But when you do that and you educate the media, you, they, you get better treatment just because they feel better about you than if you have an adversarial relationship with them all the time. Absolutely. It's the one story. I, I don't want to name the guy, but there was a, a linebacker in Miami 
that when I covered the Dolphins was available every single day. And the Dolphins' defense was a was great, right? It was Zach right. Thomas, Jason Taylor, Pat Sertan, Sam Madison, Brock Marion, David Bones, Trace Armstrong. All these. It was a great defense. And this guy was the 13th guy on the 11-man defense. <laughs> and he, 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 he struggled, and he, he had some down moments. But he was available every single day. And no one ever brought up the fact that he was the 13th guy on 11-man defense. Because right. – subconsciously you're like, ah, oh, he's a good guy. And it's like, ah, it doesn't really matter. Ah, you know, <laughs> so it, it, that, that's one thing like, you know, when, if, if I was a, a media coach with players, that was something that I would tell them too. It's like, you, you're not going to like it. You're going to have to eat it, but this is one way that you can help yourself. Yeah. And the last thing about this is so I'm working out the other day and they got, uh, I'm watching sports sniff, sniff. centers on the, yeah, sniff, sniff. Uh, I did get about eight <laughs> reps at two twenty-five. I mean, if y'all if y'all care. Um, and Joe, is uh, this where you go, sex A? Is this where you go, <laughs> you got a drop for that one? Nah, man, it won't never. It won't, I won't never have a drop for that. No, no, nah, nah. never. Trust me, he ain't never had it. <laughs> he uh, might, he might want to have you have it though. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's probably that's a whole lot of stuff like that. Uh, <laughs> and uh, they got Justin Fields doing his uh, his during the week news conference and I'm just like somebody got to talk to him and say dude your body language and everything is so horrible the vibe you're giving off is not helping you I mean you can have the same answers but your body language and everything about you is so bad right now so negative yeah that that's the vibe that you give off to everybody now that's not to say you need to be happy and cheery but pleasant you know is, is much better than than that so Acting like uh, it's the last place in the world you want to be. Yeah, exactly. So, but anyway, uh, before we let you get out of here, because we've gone over our, a lot of time, but the check was in the mail, so I'm going to take advantage of that okay. today. <laughs> <laughs> and my content guy goes, hey, where's my check? And I go, it's coming, dude. We'll do mm. that today. Mm. No comment. It's in the mail. <laughs> I, no comment. The mail gets later on a holiday week. So Yeah, you know. exactly. Uh, holiday slowed it down. That's all, you know. Uh, and I'm not even listening to that dude in Crowley out there. Yeah. Uh, I you, got a smoky, I got Smokey John's red plate for you, man. Uh, uh, okay, I'm gonna leave that. <laughs> I'm, gonna, I'm gonna let that drop right there. <laughs> <laughs> Jimmy Jerry, what's your take? Finally, and I, and I felt bad like when they announced Demarcus, right? And we all played the Demarcus. You know, we we all went down the Demarcus in the Ring of Honor. It's a great thing, but then it turns into well, what about Jimmy? And I think that was when Jerry kind of realized, you know, I'm not doing these guys any favors by doing this stuff with Jimmy. And maybe it took a Netflix uh, documentary to follow him around to help repaint that picture again. But I, I think finally is probably the right, just the right way to describe it. Probably something that should have happened sooner. I do. And I, I wasn't around here for it. I've read enough about it. I've heard both guys talk about each other without naming each other. Right. Shoot sword. Come on. <laughs> like, what are we doing here? Like, you know, eh. but I, like I said, finally, and it's good. And, and Troy will be at the game, and I'm sure Michael and Emmett will be at the game, and the, the other Ring of Honor guys will be there, and I'm sure other players from the 90s will be in town to, to celebrate the moment. Um, yeah, it's it, – and, and now whenever – whoever the next person that gets in – be it a Witten or be someone from the Landry era that they've not put in right. yet, the question wouldn't be well, – you'd never have to ask, well, when are you going to put Jimmy in? When are you going to put Jimmy in? So th- that's a <laughs> cloud that disappears from – and maybe – I don't believe in curses, even though I was a Red Sox fan, and there were, absolutely was a curse of the Bambino uh, <laughs> until they won in 2004. Maybe this right, lifts, right. lifts the curse of, of, of the Cowboys and uh, they get a Super Bowl soon. What about the Rowdy curse? I mean, it's take care of the What's Jimmy the rowdy curse. curse. I heard hey, about the blue jersey curse. I didn't no. hear about the. Hey, man, Rowdy showed up in 1996. Dame won since he showed up. Oh, okay. Now, maybe that depends on what you believe. Jerry maybe that's Jr. the next question we asked you. It's indeed Rowdy. <laughs> 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 but I don't know. All right, Todd, we appreciate your time, man. Who you got uh, Sunday? You got a score for us? Sunday? They play Thursday. I mean, Thursday. See, I'm already. Out, you, we know. started talking about Thanksgiving and then. Uh, yeah, Cowboys thirty-one ten. I like that. And that's, 
it'll be a close home game for the Cowboys. Have they had a uh, thirty to ten against the Jets? I think was the closest, but yeah, this was the second closest home game that you that they will played. All right, that's cool. That's uh, yet another Cowboy blowout win. Uh, so, all right, bro, I appreciate you, and uh, I'll talk to you in a couple of days. Sounds good. Happy Thanksgiving. Right. Thanks, man. You too. See you guys. <laughs> that's Tired Archer brought to us each and every Wednesday by my friends at Smokey John's Barbecue. I talked about the red plate. I hope you have ordered your uh, Thanksgiving meal. Let Smokey John's help you out with that. If not, hey, they still open tomorrow. You can swing by and get a jam session bowl if you want to. Uh, Wednesday is also Smoked Wednesday Wings Day. How about that? Yeah, they good too. Actually, everything over there is good. I've been trying to get Joe uh, a jam session bowl for like a month now. Uh, this is the holiday weekend, man. I may check your schedule. Let me see. Saturday, I got to watch Ohio State. But uh, Sunday, there's no Cowboys game. So I may roll out your way, man, and, and see. Now they're closed on Sunday. I don't know, man. I'm going to try to get you one soon. I ain't going to hold my breath, though. Now you'll be dead by now. But uh, I am going to try to get you one soon. Uh, yeah, for real. Because it's delicious. It's to live for. So, you know, keep on living. Keep on striving. And in case y'all forgot, that jam session bowl, man, it's a mac and cheese base or a mashed potato base. And then your choice out of two out of five smoked meats. Your boy usually rocks with the brisket and the sausage. And then all the stuff you like on a bake, on a uh, loaded baked potato, you know, chives and bacon, cheese, sour cream, all that stuff, man. They put it on top of that. And then they ask you the magic question. You want it drenched? You want it drizzled? I like it drizzled. I've known some people who like it drenched in sauce. It's delicious either way. Uh, easily, two people can eat it. If you got a little shorty, five, six, seven. Three of y'all can eat it, no problem. Uh, so get your jam session bowl. It is to live for. Now, if you want some Smokey John's and you can't live without it, and a lot of people like me like that because I got the sauce in the rub at the crib, you can have it too at the crib. All you got to do is go to SmokeyJohns.com, click on Marketplace, and order it. You can have the sauce and the rub, which is good on popcorn. That's, that's all I'm going to say. It's good on popcorn. You can have that at the crib in a couple days. Or check this out now. If you need it more immediate than that, we got an answer for you, man. Hop in the car, go to H-E-B. You can find a sauce and a rub at H-E-B, Burleson, McKinney, Waxahachie. Wherever you go to H-E-B, baby, you can find it there. Smokey John's is a spot, and the food is oh so good. Now, I was going to do something a little different today, uh, and this is a weird week. I tell y'all this all the time. It's a weird week. And so... Um, I think the best way to do it is, uh, and I say it's a weird week, and, and let me explain this to y'all. Here's why. Normally, we do four plays a day because why? We talk about the game on Sunday, on Thursday. But it always feels weird to me to talk about four plays about the game that just happened because most of y'all are already tuned in to the game that's coming up in two days. So it's a very weird dichotomy that I never quite feel right about. I feel a little like I cheated y'all a little bit if I don't do the four plays. And then I feel kind of silly about talking about the four plays. So I'm just going to do them. How about that? Uh, and then I got to tell y'all about something I smelled today. Hmm, how about that? That'll keep you hanging around. So let's go without further ado, my friend. Let me make sure I got it queued up right over here. To uh, four plays that shaped the Cowboys game in a 33-10 win. Over Carolina. This is usually when we get the music. <laughs> nah. We don't play. Hey, the man. We don't play the music. Then we may play the music around the NFL. <laughs> I'm waiting uh, on your regular ass you know to cue. You the, know what? The play. Oh, all I'm, right. I'm, we'll I'm, take doing, the music I'm doing my job. You know what? That's what I get for trying to be a smart ass. Roger. It happens sometimes. I know y'all find that hard to believe, but it does happen like that from time to time. Yeah. <laughs> so, without further ado, let's get going on the four plays that shaped the Cowboys game. Uh, if you're new to the show, uh, here's why I like four plays. And I've been doing this for a long time. I did it on radio. I've done it on uh as a newspaper guy, it's one of my favorite things to do because within every game, there's plays you kind of quit, you kind of forget in the course of the play, in the course of the game, and you'd be like, you know, if this thing had gone another way, this game might have turned out differently. And they're not always obvious plays, 
but sometimes they, they, they so those are the kind of plays we we kind of focus on. So as I look at it, man, it's 127 plays in uh, the Cowboys 33-10 win over Carolina. And it seems funny you got that many plays, and we could each pick out four plays to shape the game, and I guarantee you they probably be different in a lot of cases. But the Cowboys, uh, in my opinion, were messing around, playing with their food, not uh, not. I don't know how to say this, dog. Sometimes you feel like when you're playing an inferior team, like you should just start off and just blow them out from the beginning. But you got to remember, it's the NFL. Everybody get paid. Everybody got a game plan. Early in the game, everybody, both teams believe that they can win. And so, you know, you just have to do what you do and slowly seize control of the game. And to me, that's kind of how the Cowboys played this thing. So they're up 7 nothing, and, uh, you know, even that drive, I was like, y'all, I mean, what y'all going to do? Can we, can we get on the board? And so uh, they're moving the ball, man, and uh, as, I, as I'm looking for this, they're, they, they've, I'm trying to see because it's Carolina. If you can get up on them 14 nothing, you can force them right away to start passing, and you can put them away early. And this was a drive where I'm like, oh, they finally, they finally took my advice. I mean, we got 22 yards to Brandon Cooks on first down, first drive of the first play of the series, so you're off and running. Then you get a 28-yard pass interference that uh, C.D. Lamb gets. That moves the ball to Carolina 23. On third 19, in your mind, you've already settled for a field goal. But no, we see the rare horse collar face mask by the same player on the same player, which is crazy. Uh... And so uh, Cowboys get a first down at the 12. Tony Pollard gains a yard. But I'm still thinking they're going to score. And here's the play that had me thinking, damn. Carolina shows blitz. They come with it. Prescott knocked down at the line of scrimmage. Well played. D.J. Johnson, the rookie, third-round pick, was a fascinating guy. He started his career as a linebacker, went to tight end, back to D.N., and now playing linebacker here. And Johnson, Carolina's lucky he got his hand on this because I think that was a really well-set-up screen to the tight end, Jake Ferguson. He had number of blockers out in front of him. Nice job there by Johnson. I think he might have just saved a touchdown. Yeah, damn right. He did just save a touchdown. And that... You know, this game was a game up until the middle of the third quarter. If they score on that play, because Jake Ferguson, we have all decided, at least I have, and I'm speaking for all of y'all, he got a little shake to him. He got a little wiggle to him. He can make a guy miss. He knows how to follow his blockers. Yep. I like him as a player. Would you agree with that, bro? Oh, yeah. Most definitely. Because he even showed y'all a dance move the last couple times he scored. So, you know, he's yeah. feeling good about himself these if days. you can call it that, yeah. If you could, I mean, he's from Wisconsin, so, you know, we, we allow that to pass for a dance move. What I'm saying, though, is if he catches that ball with the guys he had in front of him, I think he takes that to the house. Instead of 10 to nothing, it's 14 to nothing. And you can always play that game about how the game would have been played differently had the score been different. But I know that the way Carolina is, they would have had to pass early because they're not going to be able to run their way back to 14 nothing. And then maybe at the end of the first half, it's, uh, it's 21 nothing or 21-3, and then it's basically over. Uh, but that was, a, uh, that was a big play by them, and it kept them in the game. That being said, Cowboys go down, get a touchdown. They kick the field goal on that drive. Carolina is down 10 nothing, And so once again, it's all about, to me, man, applying pressure to the other team. That's how I look at all these games. Because I never forget what Bill Parcells told me. Bill Parcells told me, I mean, he told a lot of people this. He said it at a press conference once or twice. But it was a big point of his. And the thing I loved about covering Parcells, man, is you learned a lot about football covering him. Like, he would teach you the game while he was covering He wasn't just answering questions. He was teaching you the game. Now, can I tell you his ulterior motive? Well, I'll take that as a yes. His ulterior motive is this. He used to set his press conference up to, to overlap with the locker room. And the more he spun a tale, the more he told a story, the less likely you were to go into the locker room, which is what he preferred. He preferred you talk to him as opposed to the players. So he was especially good during press conferences because why? He wanted to keep you captive with the information he was giving you so you would leave his players alone. Kind of a genius move. 
That being said, uh, Cowboys are up uh, 17-3 at halftime. I mean, uh, they're up 10-3. Jacques, what are you doing, son? Score is 10 to nothing. This is what I'm getting at. Having an old man move. Hey, can I tell y'all something? Normally, we tape in the morning. But today, we had some stuff, some schedules got altered, and so we taping in the afternoon. So y'all are getting afternoon Taylor as opposed to morning Taylor. And even though I had some coffee, there's just a tad bit of difference. Still good. Still good. Yeah. Uh, so, um, it's 10 nothing, and we're at the same point, man. If the Cowboys can get a stop, they can then put this game out of reach. And that's what, that's what we're looking at. And so, uh, what happens is... On a uh, situation where they force a punt, here's what happens. Hecker, oh, he's got pressure. Maybe even got a piece of it. Hecker is hit. There's a flag down. Sam Williams, who blocked one a couple weeks ago. And the Panthers down at a one, if it all counts. Well, let's see. That's like an and one in basketball. He gets, he gets roughed, he gets fouled, and he pins them inside the two. But let's watch the penalty. It's fourth and seven, so yeah. it's got to be a roughing, not a running into. And... Depends on which leg they dictate he made contact with. The plant leg is the one that can't be taken out. Otherwise, it's 15 yards. And Dean Blandino thinks this is running into the kicker, which would only be five yards. Yeah. If you mean still fourth down. And they still have to go for it. Regardless of what happens here, the offense has to go back on the field for Carolina. Running into the kicker, Dallas number 54. It's a five-yard penalty. It's still fourth down. Well, they get the five. Dog, that's a huge play. Because at that point, it's 17-3. You're in complete control. You're about to get the ball back. You're about to do what? Deliver the knockout blow. It's 24-3. It's a wrap. It's done. It's over. Their offense is not going to allow them to come back from that. Instead, it's fourth and two from the 49. Well, they got to go for it now. Well, Adam Thielen catches a pass, first down to the Dallas 35. Man, these dudes converted two more fourth downs, fourth and three from the Dallas 28, fourth and one from the Dallas 16. And all of a sudden, you know, Bryce Young throws a little short touchdown pass. Dog, it's 17 to 10 with two minutes left in the third quarter. This is a ball game. And you sitting up there going, why is this a ball game? Cowboys should be blowing these fools out. We used to blow out around here, but no, it's a ball game. And so now, and this is what I like about football, man, uh, and it's what Parcells was saying, which is there's a moment in every game where it's there to be won. And you have to understand that moment, seize it, and go win the game right there. So I'm always looking for these moments where the game is there to be won. So it's 17 10, and uh, the Cowboys go on the drive to get a couple first downs, but now. Um, they got third and five from their 40. And this is how close the game is, bro. If you can convert here, maybe you can go on and go down and score. If you don't, you got to get a ball up. And Carolina's sitting here going, we headed into the fourth quarter with a chance to tie this thing up on one drive. You might end up with a trick play. You might end up with a whole bunch of stuff now because now what? They got hope. They got belief. They smell it. So here's the, one of the pivotal plays of the game right here. Now a big third down and five. Blitz coming. Prescott, man wide open. Ferguson in stride for a first down. Boom. 24 yards, Jake Ferguson, first down. Cowboys go down. They score a touchdown on that drive. Tony Pollard with one of his best runs of the season. Churning, slashing, running through tackles, uh, touchdown, and they go up. And then uh, right after that, man, uh, your boy Deron Bland picks off a pass, and it is uh, 30 to 10 in just a matter of moments. Still, you have to, um, uh, you know, understand what's up with that, man. In, in terms of, you know, still the NFL. And so just in case, because now they still need uh, 21 points, unlikely for Carolina to do it. But on the next drive, here's a play that pretty much ends any hope of Carolina coming back. No, 14, 14. Hey, single to 14. Young in trouble, and he is sacked. It's Parsons again with help from Kurt. 
Rivers. Dude, they hadn't brought the safety in a minute. They brought J. Ron Curse off the edge. It was a first down play. All of a sudden, second and 18. And now they have to pass. The feeding frenzy is out. They get sacked on the next play by Dorrance Armstrong and Goldston, Charleston Goldston. And then they wrap it up, man, on the third down and 24. Another sack. Uh, this time Dallas recovers. It sets up their, their final field goal. 33-10. Dallas and um, you know I tell you man sometimes they play like it's a basketball game they get these runs uh, especially because their defense is so opportunistic and uh, they can run you and I'm sorry they can blow you out real quickly and that's what happened 16 points in the fourth quarter turned the game that was 17-10 into a 33-10 blowout it was a it was a pretty big it was a pretty big play by the, the first round pick Maisie Smith on that sack because he took the center and the garden and Micah looped around him and everybody and went up the middle. Now, that's a great point because it's not that he's getting any numbers, but he is um, – he's been a lot more active the last two or three weeks. He may finally be figuring some things out. Uh, he may be trying to distance himself from that cheating-ass program he went to. Um, but he's playing some good football right now. And uh, it's at the right time, man. Uh, you know, every rookie doesn't come in and blow it up right away. And if they can get him to be a good player, because he's not a good player right now. He's an average player. Uh, if they can get him a good player uh, right now, uh, I think uh, he could be a real asset to them come playoffs because San Francisco likes to run the ball. Uh, Philly likes to run the ball. That's why they got him. Yeah. As long as he peaks at that particular time, um, they're going to be in good shape. Well, part of his ability is his mass. You know, he's so big. And that's what, ha- that's what happened on that play is that he took the guard in the center. I don't know why. I don't, I don't think they doubled him as much as he got into him. And then Michael went around him. That, that, it, was a pretty cool, it was a pretty cool stunt. All right. Well, good. Thank you for that. Uh, let's, um, let's go around the block. Let's end the show going around the block. Uh, because uh, <clears throat> yeah, there go your music. Thank you. I've been. Uh, I, I I don't. I'm, I'm gonna share with y'all today. Big Joe and the Big Rig has known this for a long time. I think he used to criticize me for it some, or at least he used to make fun of my term for it. I've been a metrosexual for a long time. Uh, you know, I like lotions. I like body scrubs. All that massages, you know, I used to get my toes done on a regular basis. Uh, I like to feel good mentally and physically. And so that's always been a part of my game. Now, somehow, I seem to have passed that on to my son, who asked his mother the other day. I was listening, on because we were together, he was talking to his mother on the phone. He said, hey, can you pick me up some facial products? And she said yes He said thank you And that denoted to me that One he does this quite frequently Two She knew exactly what products he was talking about And three He was referring to more than one product Okay so where am I going with this Dude You know what I've been doing for the last week I've been obsessed With trying to get my place To smell a certain way because I'm all into aromatherapy Because I'm trying to be more relaxed at home And so I went out Don't judge me I went out and bought a uh, A uh, essential oils diffuser So what happens is you, you buy this thing You plug it up It heats up some water Creates steam You put the oils in the water And scented steam comes out And makes your place smell good so I bought these at Target. I did some research. I went and bought them at Target. And for the next three or four days, I couldn't really get the smell the way I wanted. And so I was thinking, maybe the ones I got weren't good enough. I didn't spend enough money. So then I went online and checked out the best essential oil diffusers in the country or, you know, available within reason. I mean, I wasn't spending like three or four or five hundred dollars on them. But I found one. I'm going to share with y'all. Here's about 100 But it had 30-back money-back guarantee. So, okay, cool. 
So I got this And it's, it's a beautiful thing Looks good And so I put the oil in there Now check this out On the ones I bought from Target Which were about $20 I bought two of them Because my thought was I put one in my main room And one in my bedroom But I would have a different scent in my bedroom more like a lavender to help you go to sleep. I'm just thinking here because I'm trying to I'm trying to change my I'm trying to get my moods aligned up with the aromatherapy. So when I bought the ones from Target, man, now I've never had one of these. The instruction said put four to five drops of the oil in the diffuser. Dog, I put four or five drops in there. I ain't smell nothing. Nothing. So I put 10 drops in there I didn't smell nothing So then my new one came in I promise you this is the truth The new one said hey put the water in the diffuser blah, blah. Put 20 to 30 drops In there I said at least that makes more sense to me Like the more you put in there The more you'll smell it The other one just seems stupid to me Like 5 drops in probably 4 or 5 ounces of water That's not really making a dent now y'all should know me by now By now you should know me So that one That one smelled It still wasn't strong enough But I got the idea What do you think I did though? You doubled it it's, That my friend is a good guess Man I went on Amazon And you know they sell these essential oils In little bottles that are about Three tenths of an ounce So they're small bottles Dog, I went out and bought me a 24 ounce jug So that I can go get me an eyedropper And put, you know, the equivalent of like An ounce in there every time I use it So, I had three of them So I left to go to the Cowboys today And I left all three of them I loaded them up before I left I went overboard with the oil And for the first time, I want to tell y'all When I walked in the door I said, this is what I've been trying to accomplish this right here is heaven. Sweet orange. I love it. Thank you. This is what I've been trying to do. So I was very pleased. Now, while I'm up here doing the podcast at night, I did the same thing. I, f- I had them, I refilled them before I left. So when I return to my spot, it should smell heavenly when I walk in the door. The only downside, and there's no getting around this, it's like anything, is what? Once you've been exposed to the scent for a couple minutes, you can't really smell it no more because you're adjusted to it. It don't matter. It's worth it for me to come home. Every time I leave, I've decided I'll just do it when I leave, and then that way I smell it. So that's me on my journey for aromatherapy. I ordered three jugs because I can't do anything half ass. Ordered lavender, sweet orange, and grapefruit. I like grapefruit smell. Uh, those things get me alive in the morning And then I've decided I'm going to buy a couple more Because one of them doesn't just work enough to me I'm going to put two of them in my bedroom So that then I'm going to keep the doors closed Then when I put them on When I'm ready to go to bed I should walk in there and say Ah, the sweet smell of lavender And that should allow me to go to sleep You need me to bring you one, though? Nah, I was just thinking, man <laughs> If, if I if I made you feel some kind of way, call you. You want to be metrosexual and all that? That must have been about 1989. I mean, 19, 1999 or two. Somewhere around there. Somewhere around there. 2023. Are you trying to tell me you've changed? You've grown? No. You can be whatever sexual you want to be. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. <laughs> whatever one you can add, whatever, and then sexual to the end of it. To the end of that, I ain't gonna ridicule really you. You wanna go still, get your feet done with I the next one? God, don't nobody need to touch my feet. I'm just saying. I get paid by the United States government because my feet are bad. So they might want to do it, dog. No, I, I've had that done. I've had the manicure. I've I've been exfoliated. All that <laughs> stuff. But you can't never call so me. So you a metrosexual? No, team? no, 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 no. It's okay, dog. No. That's not I don't know what the hell that is But it ain't <laughs> It ain't what you saying it is But Whatever kind of sex Will you want to be you can Let me look it up Put the in Hey Hey Look that Look it up Metrosexual meaning Yeah 
relating or denoting men who live in an urban area and enjoy shopping, fashion, and similar interests traditionally associated with women or gay men. But this must be an old, an old definition. Oh, you looked it up. <laughs> you looked it up. You looked it up. You call yourself. Oh, here we you go. Call Here's your, a more. No, no. You look. You Here's call a more yourself, updated, a more updated one. A usually urban heterosexual male given to enhancing his personal appearance by fastidious grooming, beauty treatments, and fashionable clothes. Okay, a metrosexual is happy getting a medic- pedicure and a manicure. He's hip. Urban, sophisticated, and above all, stylish. All right, yeah, then. that's me, mother. That, oh, that's man, you. I forgot. I almost, I almost Doc, lost myself. Hey, knock man. yourself out. <laughs> all your right, metro, motherfucker, that's me. With your <laughs> metrosexual ass. All right, then. Shit, knock yourself out. Old, uh, re, old recon ain't gonna never be metro <laughs> metrosexual. I'm sorry. Nah, man. You should. Uh, I can imagine you sitting on top of a rock for four days. Nah, being being as mex- metrosexual as you want to be. I don't have to imagine. I, I don't have to imagine a damn thing because <laughs> it never happened. Uh, but you can do what you want because you all your your fashion. We 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 talked about the pink shirt the other day. Did we damn sure did. Dog. Your, your fashion is ten thousand ti- times longer than mine, and so I don't. <laughs> and I have no problem with that. It's all good. That seems like a great note to go out on. We, we wish everybody a uh, happy and wonderful Thanksgiving. Uh, what's your favorite food on Thanksgiving, Doc? Bone and ham. Is that right? Oh, wait. Yes, ma'am. I mean, yes, sir. Yeah, all right. What's up with that? You no, know, oh, no. I was just, I was, what I was thinking was, I love meals cooking because usually I'm saying, yes, ma'am, that ham is good. You yeah. know, so that's, what, that's where I was going with that because I was just about to say, I love I love her cooking. Yeah. I like uh, I like a little sweet potato casserole, a little mm. turkey breast. I don't think I ever had. I don't think uh, I ever had sweet potato casserole. Oh, it's delicious, man! Basically, sweet potato pie without the crust. <laughs> you know what's uh, become a staple around here? Chitlins. No, your wife introduced your ex-wife. <laughs> uh, Denise Taylor introduced us to the corn casserole. Is that right? That's right. I don't know when we had it. I think she just made it. Right, right. But, was it good? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We got our own little twist, but that's become a staple for years. We nah, love all right. I like some good greens. I haven't had it in a long time. Yep, and everybody can't make. Everybody who say they got greens can't make greens. My uh, wife made greens. My grandmother taught her. Hey, I, I'm just saying. You know that pot liquor. Need a couple of that. Uh, what I want for Thanksgiving, man. I'm gonna put an order out there. I'm gonna see if somebody gonna bless me. And I want some hot water cornbread, man. My grandmama turned me on to it when I was a little boy. My aunt Candy, she used to she used to tell me, "Poo," she don't want to call me that. When are you coming home to Nashville, man? If I tell her, plane, she said, "Tell me when you get to the airport. Tell me when you land, because I want it hot coming out the skillet when you yep. show up." Yep. And that's why I love that woman. To this day yep. Her birthday Her heavenly birthday Was uh, 10 10 She been gone About a year and a half Oh My Aunt Candy Woo I'm kissing her man Not you uh, So yeah Y'all enjoy Thanksgiving Some macaroni and cheese Be good uh, Hey Don't put no raisins In nothing Some of y'all If you do If you know You know That's all I'm gonna say uh, Don't forget I'm still trying to get my Twitter up. It got mysteriously deleted. JJT, journalist. I am Jean-Jacques Taylor. Uh, We always appreciate the Green and Law Firm for supporting the program, Smokey John's Barbecue. And uh, Coach Prime, Deion Sanders and the Making of Men, makes a wonderful Christmas gift. So uh, until we chat again, you guys be blessed.